ready to get underway tonight and we're going to return to the verses of scripture that we were looking at in chapter 7 in our lesson last week as we were uh, in lesson 18 of your outline that you have talking about uh, those who are uh, going to be saved during the tribulation period that's what chapter 7 uh, is dealing with and you remember that I shared with you that this chapter is in parenthesis. Uh, it's not following in sequential order in terms of where we ended in chapter 6. We'll pick that back up here very shortly, but uh, a lot of additional information that's given to us here uh, that's taking place during this period of time. We've talked about uh, three groups of people that we know of that will be experiencing salvation during the days of the tribulation period. In chapter 6, we looked at the remnant that was saved and martyred during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. Here in chapter 7, we have already talked about the Jews that will be saved 12,000 from each tribe that will be sealed for a total of 144,000 and they will not be harmed by the Antichrist and those who work with him during this period of time they will be preserved then we started talking about the Gentiles or a host of people that I believe are Gentiles here, a great multitude starting in verse 9. And I'm going to pick up the reading with verse 9 and go through verse 17 again. That's actually a reread, but uh, you'll hopefully see my reasoning behind that here in just a few minutes. Verse 9 says, After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Great, great multitude here. These are folks that are saved during the latter part or the last half of the three of the uh, tribulation period the last three and a half years they are folks who hear the message of the 144,000 and the message of the two witnesses and probably the testimonies of people who are saved along the way and they see what happens to those people and yet they still choose to accept um, the message that they hear and 
they experience salvation, but it costs them their lives. Uh, this is going to be a horrible time uh, to be living during these days. I want us to look at the characteristics of these people as they are identified in these verses. Hence, that was the reason for the rereading of verses 9 through 17. There are several characteristics and things that we can pick up out of these verses that uh, will be meaningful to us, I believe, beginning with the fact that in verse 9, we are brought to understand their position. They are standing before the throne, and this is a, a great number. We don't know the number. Wouldn't want to even hazard a guess as to the number. It's a, a great multitude of people. We know that it's made up of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. So that means there's Jews and Gentiles, most likely that's in this particular group. And so that means that there will be Jews beyond the 144,000 that will be sealed and we know they will be saved, but there will be more beyond that that will be saved during that period of time. And here we find them uh, standing before the throne. They stood before the throne and before the Lamb. These stand, whereas when you think of the church being represented by the 24 elders, those 24 elders are seated around the throne. These are standing before the throne. And the thing that uh, we think that is very significant about them standing before the throne is to recognize that they're in the presence of the one who is seated upon the throne. And that's a wonderful thing. That certainly indicates that they have been saved for this is a heavenly scene that we're looking at here and they share in the honor of the lamb the honor of the lord jesus because they are his willing servants and they have given their lives for him they have not yielded to the requests that were imposed upon them they have been willing to sacrifice themselves and pay the ultimate price in order to uh, stand for the Lord the days that they had the privilege of doing that when they were here on earth. Therefore, they now stand in his presence. We find that the second thing that is noted about them is that they are clothed with white robes. Being clothed with white robes suggests their spiritual purity uh, before the the Lord. Uh, their salvation is just like your salvation and mine. It will be at that time, just as it is today. Their salvation is through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And having had his blood applied, then they are clothed in his righteousness. And it is a righteousness in which no fault can be found whatsoever because it is a perfect righteousness. While they were here on earth, yes, we might say they performed good works to someone who would ask the question and say, well, did these people uh, do good works while they were here upon the earth? And was it their works that brought about their salvation? Uh, and the answer to that is, yes, they did good works, but no, it was not their works that brought about their salvation. They, just as we, had to, they will have to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. They will have to have his precious blood applied because, you see, God only has one way to be saved. One and only way. One and only one way, I should say. Contrary to many in our world tonight who are saying there are different ways to get to heaven, please don't let any of those folks deceive 
uh, you in any way when you hear them say that. Uh, and we could name some folks, some prominent folks that people watch on TV. That's why it's important to be able to be uh, one who is well versed in the scripture to know how to discern when the truth is being taught and when it is not being taught. Because there are many today who are not teaching the truth, yet they're purporting to be. And folks, just because they are a preacher or uh, a spiritual leader or whatever, they take them at their word and believe everything that they say. Don't believe everything that you hear by televangelists and uh, others who are uh, teaching and preaching these days. God has only one way of saving people. That's the way it's always been. Even in Old Testament times, what was required of Abraham? Righteousness. Faith. And faith was imputed unto him for right, or his uh, faith enabled his, uh, righteousness, the righteousness of God to be imputed unto him as a result of his faith in God. Right on down through the, the pages of time, uh, the men that we look at and have great respect for in the scriptures, the difference then and now and in the future is that those in the Old Testament era, and you've heard this explanation, I know, many times before, so it's redundant for me to, to share it with you, but uh, they were looking toward the cross out there in the future, believing that some at some point in time, God was going to send his lamb to pay the supreme sacrifice, and God did just that. He sent his only begotten son to do that. Since the cross, we look, as it were, back to the cross and the great price that the Lord Jesus paid there on the cross. These in the tribulation period who are saved will also be exercising faith in the work that the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross. So what we need to understand about this is that God's plan has always been through the blood of the Lamb, and it always will be. There's no reason to be confused about that, and there's no reason to be led astray by all those who would say, there's so many other ways that you can get to heaven, that you can get to God. There's only one, only one, according to what my Bible teaches. Um, as a matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 29, 30, and 31 sound a warning for those who deny redemption through the blood. A uh, very, very important warning that needs to be heeded. Maybe I ought to just, uh, just back up and, and read that if, if I can get to it here real quick. Hebrews uh, chapter 10 and verse number 29. Listen to these words. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Uh, those words are not underlined in uh, the Bibles that we go and purchase off of the bookshelf, and they're not words that are in red, but those words are so powerful for me personally that I have verse 31 underlined in my Bible. As a reminder, whenever I flip to this page, 
It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. We better make sure that the blood of the Lamb is covering us, hadn't we? Otherwise, it's a fearful thing. So, we see their position. We see their purity. Thirdly, verse 9 tells us that they have palms in their hands. And those palms indicate that they are being protected. And as a result of that protection, they are expressing the joy that is theirs as they hold these palms. And probably the scripture doesn't say this, uh, that they are waving those palms, but maybe they are because they're experiencing such joy. They're celebrating the joy of the fact that they were protected for the days that they were while here upon the earth after having placed their faith in the Lord. They are very thankful and very happy that they were protected by the Lord. As a matter of fact, they go forward in verse 10 praising the Lord, which is why I say it may be that they are waving those palms. The scripture, again, I repeat, just doesn't say that, but we do note in verse 10 that they cry with a loud voice um, and they say, salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and to the lamb who is there standing by the throne, as we've already noted. They attribute salvation to God the Father and God the Son. That's an appropriate thing to do, don't you think? And it seems to me that whenever we look at this, it's a big host. Again, I just remind you, we don't know the number of the people that are here, but it seems that all of them are crying in unison with this loud voice together and saying salvation to our God, giving him praise and honor and glory. They are really, really thankful and no one is silent. No one is quiet. Uh, this is a time of tremendous praise that is taking place. Isn't it true that any time a work of grace takes place in a person's heart and life, it causes that individual to praise the Lord? You know, when we think about what we could have been apart from the Lord, and we know what we are through the Lord, don't that cause our cup of joy to overflow? And sometimes don't it cause us maybe in an hour when we're by ourselves, uh, we just get uh, plumb emotional about it. And that's okay. Um, you know, sometimes I'm, I've told you before, sometimes I'm by myself, but God will speak to my heart about something and I'll be reflecting on that. And uh, boy, the emotions start coming forth and all I can do is just say, thank you, Lord. I can't thank you enough. I can't praise you enough. I can't give you enough glory. Thank you for being so good to me. I tell you, those are wonderful times. They are, they are great times. And that's kind of what's taking place here. The, the storm for these folks is over. They are now standing there before the throne. Therefore, they are praising the, the Lord and they're praising the Father for sending the Son and for the great work that has been completed for them. And notice something else, if you will, that's interesting here. This praise is so strong, so loud, uh, so uh, uh, filled with... Uh, their energy and so forth. Verse 11 says, all the angels stood round about the throne and about, and all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. I mean, now that's, that's exuberant praise, right? Uh, 
they their praise caused this angelic host to fall before the Lord and to worship Him. And um, I would say that right here is the, the, the perfect worship service. This is the perfect work, uh, worship service. Uh, you won't find anyone, uh, any better example, I suppose, in the scripture than this one here of how uh, these uh, beings are worshiping the one who is on the throne and worshiping the son. And as they fall down, they say, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom. Think about all these words that they are using here. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. It began with an amen and it ends with an amen. Now that's wonderful. That's powerful, isn't it? What a great, great uh, worship experience uh, that takes place there whenever this occurs. Then we notice the privilege that these folks have. I've already covered verses 13 and 14. I mentioned that last week when uh, John was asked by one of the elders, who are these that are here praising and worshiping the Lord like this? with the loud voices and so forth. And basically John says in our words, well, you know who they are. And then he defines who they are. They are those that came out of great tribulation. And we think of the last three and a half years as being the period of great tribulation, tremendous suffering and so forth that will occur. And have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Now, verse 15 talks about the privilege that these folks have. Therefore, are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. What a great privilege. Now, they do not reign with the Lamb as we who are a part of the church will reign with the Lamb. <laughs> but they do serve the Lamb. That's a very key point. The church will reign with the Lamb, but these folks will have their own respective responsibilities and duties that they will fulfill uh, as they serve the Lord. There are different thoughts about what is meant here about serving in his temple day and night. Uh, depending on who you read after, you might find different opinions. There are those who suggest that this temple most likely would represent the millennial temple on earth, but these folks are in heaven. So Walford, John Walford talks about how that may not be so significant to dwell on the temple. It might be, in my words, more significant to think about the fact that these folks are in the presence of the Lord and therefore they will be serving the Lord, fulfilling whatever his desires are for them to do uh, in heaven. Different points of view there. We can't say that one is right or another is wrong. We do know that uh, this says they will be serving him day and night. And we think in terms of heaven, just giving you some thoughts here, some things to think about, as being a place where there will be no more night. Uh, but, <clears throat> you know, at the time that John was writing this, <clears throat> it might just very well be that this was the best words that he was given to be able to articulate what needed to be shared about what was taking place at this particular point. Um, we do know this, that they will serve very readily. They won't have to be urged and pushed and prodded and probed to get 
uh, them to serve, they're going to recognize <clears throat> that they have a tremendous privilege, and that privilege is to serve the Lord in whatever capacity He wishes for them to serve Him, and they will do it with great gladness. They will be overjoyed to have the privilege to serve the Lord. <clears throat> so uh, they will fulfill that privilege and recognize it to be such for them there at that particular time. They will be provided for in great, great measure. <clears throat> the scripture goes on to say that they are not going to hunger anymore. Uh, they won't have to worry about being sunburned anymore. They won't have to worry about those powerful rays of the sun that will be experienced during the last half of the tribulation period affecting them anymore. They won't have to worry about any more of the schemes of the Antichrist and his vices and the harm that that brings to them because they have profess their faith in the Lord and not been ashamed of declaring that faith in the Lord. So they will not hunger anymore. They will not thirst anymore. Again, neither shall the sun light on them nor any uh, heat. They will be provided for. And verse 17 is a beautiful, beautiful verse in the scripture. A beautiful verse. The first part of the verse says, For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. Then it goes forward and says, And shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. Now think about that. <clears throat> the Lamb is going to provide for them. The Lamb, we think of Him as being the shepherd, don't we? For, for you and me tonight, we think of the Lord Jesus as being our good shepherd, don't we? And what does the shepherd do for his sheep? He provides for them, and he guides them, and he leads them, and he provides them with food, and he leads them to the water so that they will be able to drink. Well, that imagery fits this passage of Scripture here. The Lord is going to provide for these people for every need that they have. Those things that they've suffered under the Antichrist will be passed. They won't have to worry about those things anymore. The famine here upon this earth that will take place, they will not have to worry about that. The sun as it scorches the earth, I've already referred to that, but they won't have to worry about that. They refused the mark of the beast. They said, no, our faith is in our Savior, in the Lord Jesus. And because they refused the mark of the beast, most likely they were hungry, maybe even thirsty, because without the mark of the beast, remember what that means? If you don't have the mark of the beast, you can't buy, you can't sell. They won't be able to go to Walmart and get enough to eat. They won't be able to go to a food line or whatever the, the stores around the world may be at that time. They probably for a number of days here upon this earth experienced hunger, thirst, <coughs> felt themselves to be very detached from everybody else and desolate in so many ways. But now... Things have changed and they're in the presence of the one who will be their source of eternal comfort forever and ever and ever. The lamb will provide for them. Boy, that's a beautiful, beautiful thing to think about. And as if that's not enough in that one verse of scripture, and I'm going to stop with this right here in just a minute. <clears throat> the last words of this verse of scripture are intriguing to say the least. Those last words are, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now think about that. <clears throat> the final words of this 
informational chapter that's in parenthesis before the resumption of judgment starts again, these final words are significant. They mean something. God shall wipe away all tears. Well, why would that be the case? God's seated on the throne. I think it's the case because God is going to prove that he who gave the lamb will also be one who will nurture them. <coughs> and the lamb is there with him, so the father has the privilege to show how nurturing his nature is for them in true reality right there before their eyes. Life, no doubt for these people before they died, was filled with a lot of tears. No doubt those days were very, very hard for them. But now they're in the presence of God. They're in the presence of the Lamb. They are standing before the throne. They are in heaven. And now the Father shows how compassionate He is, how loving and kind He is, how much He cares for those who receive His Son as their personal Savior. I believe that those folks at that time will come to completely understand some words that Paul wrote in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. And I've used these words a lot of times through the years, but I think they stand out in this passage of Scripture where Paul is talking about the struggles of life. And there's a lot of good things that's found in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. We have things like adoption uh, that we have already talked about and discussed. We have the passage where we quote when folks are having difficulty in their lives and we say, well, brother or sister, listen, the scripture says in Romans 8, 28, you know what it says? We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. But there was a verse of Scripture earlier that Paul penned, and it goes like this, verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. These folks, beloved, I suggest unto you are realizing at the point in time of, what, uh, of, of where we're reading here in the Scripture as they stand before the throne that all those sufferings of the past are not worthy to be compared with the glory that they're experiencing there in the presence of the Lamb and in the presence of the one seated upon the throne. To me, there's a a real sense of depth and tenderness to this phrase here. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Think about what a joy it must be or will be for Jesus to be standing there by the side of the Father and seeing His Father reach out and wipe away the tears of those that have received His Son as their Savior. You ever thought about it from that standpoint? Think about it. Think about those children whenever uh, God blessed our home to have them and they were coming up and they had tears in their eyes and we'd get them and we would nurture them in our, or uh, hold them in our arms drop my handkerchief here, make my point. We'd take that handkerchief out and we'd take their eyes and we'd wipe them tenderly and say, honey, it's going to be okay. 
Can you imagine God the Father saying, children, it's going to be okay. It's all over. You don't have to worry about it anymore. You're safe. You're at home now. Folks, the day is coming when God will remove all things that cause tears to my eyes, to your eyes, and to those out there in the future. The day's coming. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for a great time like this to study such a touching passage of Scripture. We thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit's leadership. We pray that you will guide and you will direct each of our hearts as we reflect, hopefully, often on these thoughts and our future as a part of the bride of Christ and what we will experience too. For our experience will be equally as great as the experience of this great host and what they experience whenever they are in your presence. Lord, thank you for how you will one day put away all sorrow, all sadness, and all tears will be wiped away We'll come to another thought regarding this in the future, and I pray that our hearts will be warmed and touched by that which you help us to see and understand from your precious word. We only pray in Jesus' name. Amen.